Greetings everyone, hey how you doing? It's Matt Sella and today we are doing a season one review for Netflix's Kipo Age of the Wonder Beast, the latest animated series. And this time around I am actually joined here in person, we finally got him off the moon, we finally got him away from that weird ass galaxy where all the droids hang out, and we also got him out of other things that I probably referenced in previous reviews. In person right now, it's Mark. How you doing Mark? It's good to be here in the apocalypse, I mean 2020. <laughs> Why? Cutting straight through chase. Yeah, it pretty much is kind of a weird year so far. But hey, Mark, I'm really happy that we finally got you back here, even if it's just for this one show. And I hear it's not quite up your alley, but that's okay. It's not quite mine either. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. We are talking about Kipo and the Age of the Wonder Beast. And before we begin, must reassure this, this is two adults, animator, art appreciators, connoisseurs, as you once described, Mark, mm -hmm. talking about animated TV shows, but in a critique, sort of a discussion kind of way. So this video, as well as all my other videos, are not intended for kids. So please bear that in mind. Any kids who are here right now, get the hockey puck out of here. Anyway, Mark. Why don't you give the fine folks here a basic synopsis of the season we saw. And oh, and also to reiterate, uh, this is technically a spoiler discussion. We are going to try to be a little vague about how it ends, but we might get there anyway. Just bear that in mind. Mark, take it away. All right. Well, Kipo Oak is a young girl with purple skin who's about 13 years old and searching for her father after being forced to flee their underground city. To do so, she must travel an overgrown apocalyptic urban city ruled by mutant animals known as mutes. Together, she makes new friends with a girl named Wolf, a pig named Mondu, Benson and Dave as they go on a quest to reunite with her family in their new bunker. Yeah, that's pretty much the basic summary of this uh, first season. So now what did I think of it overall? Well, it's a little tough for me to say because I understand that this show, I think, Mark, is supposed to be heavily inspired by some of the anime approaches on shows, I would say. The low frame rate style that they got going, like it's very much a show that's kind of shot on threes or fours. It has that choppy kind of straight ahead style animation going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not terribly a fan of that style of animation, to be honest. I, if it were up to me, I'd rather it be on twos, be a little more fluent, say like for DuckTales or Owl House and various shows like that. I'm kind of used to that kind of animation style. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, as an outsider looking in, this very much reminds me of Avatar The Last Airbender, that style of animation. I'm not talking about like the visual style of the characters. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about how they move. Because mm -hmm. like a lot of times when I feel like people talk about, and we've talked about this before on the show, people confuse art style and art direction with the quality of the animation. Yeah, no, those are drastically we're talking, different We're talking things. about the movement of the character, not the way it's drawn or anything like that. Because otherwise, I actually think in many ways, this is a very nice looking show. Like if you take a screen cap of it, it looks very nice. But it's when someone's moving or talking that things don't quite flow very naturally is what I think you're trying to say. That's exactly what I'm trying to get at. So please bear that in mind, folks who follow this channel long enough. That is usually what we mean between art style and animation. Mm -hmm. Two different things. The illusion of life. Exactly. Now, kind of piggybacking off of what you kind of said there, Mark, I actually do kind of like the visual style of the show. It's a little hard to take in at first, especially like how they drew Kipo's eyes. Like I'm not used to like that angular look mm -hmm. and kind of like the simplified anatomy on some of the characters. It did come across as a little inconsistent for me where there are some other characters who kind of look more realistic mm -hmm. or had more unique characteristics that I could easily convey into a real life human being. But as I saw it kind of going, like I got used to it and I thought it worked. And I actually do kind of dig Kipo's design. Like I thought she was kind of charming and the way they wrote her character, I actually thought was really interesting where she is a very passive person. Like she doesn't like to fight or resort to violence or tribalistic methods or whatever. She would rather try talking with others first to reason with and hopefully come to a deal of some sort. Whereas the other characters, such as Wolf, which I actually thought she was an interesting character. I like how kind of PTSD she is in terms of how she views mutes and how to navigate the surface world and all that stuff is a really good contrast to Kipo, in my opinion. Whether that works or not, uh, it's a little too early to tell. We do test that a little bit here. Um, Mark, did you have any opinions on Kipo or Wolf? I was just going to say, out of all the characters, I definitely like Wolf the best. I think her backstory is actually very interesting. That being said, narratively, I think where that backstory was revealed was kind of weird. You think it was premature or a little too late? A little late, because like I feel like it was always 
Im- there was implications of that. Not exactly, but like that, of course, she had a rough life, but like where it was, it was also, well, the trouble with the backstory for me was it was also revealed with this whole notion that she was, spoiler alert, hiding some information from Kipo. And that I feel like those two stories were kind of at odds with each other because they both kind of happened relatively at the same moment. So neither quite got the chance to breathe for the weight that they both had. I could definitely see that. Like, and this is the weird thing, like Mark and I, we were kind of talking about this off podcast here. It's like, I kind of really wish Netflix would go the weekly release route instead of the binging thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know we all would rather just watch everything at our own pace at our own time, but there's something about the weekly release I'm starting to really appreciate here. Not only because I can make more videos talking about these things, but I also get to soak in more Mm -hmm. of what just happened and I can like lay on it, think about it and wonder what's going to happen next. I mean, The Mandalorian did a really great job at doing that, in Mm -hmm. my opinion. I'm really liking how Owl House has been doing it so Mm -hmm. far and we only got two episodes i wish i had more time to really think about what these characters are going through in each episode of kipo Mm -hmm. now to kind of jump to the other characters and i'm gonna address the elephant in the room here because i watch like a whole slew of different people's opinions on things and all that stuff and there i've seen some videos that kind of like throw some shade at DreamWorks, at least their advertising company of how they pitch things to people. And they're supposed, I'm not saying one way or the other, but their approach on some of the LGBTQ type issues and acceptance within media and uh, culture. In this show, we actually do have a moment of a character revealing their homosexuality. And when that happened, I actually thought it was done fairly well, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like, normally with these kind of shows, a lot of people like to point out that it's kind of pandering or the way they do it seems very artificial. Or they don't commit to it. They They, tease with it. They tease with it. They don't commit with it. Yeah, exactly. The way this show kind of handles it, I think is probably like one of the most natural approaches that could happen. Mm -hmm. It also highlights an issue that could come up that be a misunderstanding, but just because it's a misunderstanding, that's okay. It happens. We Mm -hmm. can all still work together, be together, and like each other. The only thing that I can really put against it, and this has nothing to do with the issue itself, but in this one episode where Kipo celebrates her birthday at Ratland, Mm -hmm. and one of her friends that she's been traveling with, Benson, Mm -hmm. I believe is his name, uh, takes her on a day out to kind of just try to enjoy life, not worry about trying to find her father or the burrow of her people. He wants her to enjoy herself Mm -hmm. to the point where Kipo's turning 13. She's going through, you know, the usual teenage whatever thing. Mm -hmm. And she kind of starts to think to herself that she's developing feelings for Benson in a I like like you kind of way. He, on the other end of this, comes out and says like, oh, oh, I I didn't mean to let you on like that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually gay. I'm Mm -hmm. sorry. And she kind of feels like embarrassed by that. But Benson says, but I still like you, though. Mm -hmm. And like the way they handled it, I thought that was really sweet. It worked. Mm -hmm. The gripe that I'm trying to pull up here is I feel like I've seen that scene almost beat by beat before recently. Like, I swear, I thought I, I don't know if it was a TV show or a movie where it was a very similar situation where a young girl was starting to develop feelings for a guy. She confesses to him, but the guy's, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to mislead you like that. I'm actually gay. I still don't mind being your friend and being there for you. I'm sorry about this. And she's like, no, no, I'm sorry. And then like, it ends happily and they're in a high place looking over something. I swear I've seen that before somewhere. So take that as a negative as you want, folks. But And, and just, just to clarify, you it's just the fact that you've seen that scene play out similarly somewhere else. You have nothing against the scene itself. Nothing against the scene itself. Just the fact that I think I've seen it beat by beat. So that could kind of take away the impact it could have had for me. Mm-hmm. But Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Because I actually liked, because we've uh, had some shows where it's been heavily implied about a character's sexuality, but like in some instances, people have accused comp- produce studios of teasing or not committing to anything. I do like that. It was just like, yeah, Benson's gay. That, that's it. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. Like it's not a not an issue. Yeah. He's just another guy. Yeah. So I think they did a good job there. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, getting off of that topic here, let's talk about Dave a little bit here. Dave. Dave, the, the bug. immortal bug. The immortal bug. I thought he was. I'm actually, glad we have immortal bug representation. I know. I, I was an immortal bug myself. I thought it was great how he, he goes through his entire life cycle over and over again. It's not like a fly where it's like, oh, he's born. He's, uh, do, uh, he's old. Uh, he's dead now. No, he, he just keeps like reincarnating himself. And it's funny how they use that a little bit throughout the show. 
as a joke, but also kind of like a, a little bit of like an impediment on them a little bit until like maybe the very end. Because there's been a few times where the the cast was in major trouble, mm-hmm. major some major shit going down. And Dave could have helped them get out of there easily. So it's like, okay, come on, become an adult, become an adult. And it's like, it doesn't happen until he finally does like, yes, I'm an adult beetle. I'm ready. To-. And then he becomes an old man instantly. He's yeah. like, God damn, never works when I wanted to. It, it's kind of a visual representation of, I think, his own confidence, really. Yeah, no, it definitely is. But it's funny how like near the end, it finally worked in his favor mm-hmm. somehow. So there were some good payoffs, in my opinion, for that. Did you have any opinions on Benson or particularly Dave? Or did you want to talk about the couple of the villains of this series? I like Benson and Dave. I like all the main characters just fine. Um, I think Wolf is definitely the more interesting of them. But in all fairness, Kipo gets some more interesting story beats, but really towards the end of this season. And I feel like that's going to be the questions and things we have answered in season two. So it's kind of hard to say because we'd, we'd be speculating a bit. There are some other fun characters too. Um, there is a fun uh, frog character who has a bit of a change of perspective uh, who's pursuing them throughout the series. He's kind of the first of the mutes they really encounter and face off against. But um, really, there's a really fun character, a villain in Charlemagne the Mandrill. But I feel like and this is a bit of a problem. The beginning of the series isn't too s- story heavy but then towards the end it gets really story heavy and i would have liked it more spread out for a more consistent thing yeah no i definitely agree there and i think at this point right now let's just talk about our general feelings over the season right now Mm -hmm. if i understand correctly like a lot of people are praising the show for it which uh, i see it's fair it's totally fair uh my overall problem with the show right now is I'm kind of having trouble getting into the pacing of the story. Like, I really feel like it takes a while to get to places. Mm -hmm. And there's been a couple episodes where Kipo and the gang get a clue on how to find Kipo's father and the burrows. And yet suddenly they're kind of like distracted by something, like something gives them a detour, or they have something that ends up turning into a big adventure of retrieving it. And I had trouble feeling like, okay, is this proper story progression or is this filler? There, There are some episodes where it feels like you could watch the beginning of the episode cut out the middle and watch the ending and still get the same story beats yes and i think that's probably like one of my bigger problems with the show is that it just it had trouble keeping that level of engagement without it feeling a little bit fluffed out for lack of a better word i think it kept it towards the end though and i hope it keeps building on that momentum for season two i agree there and I I keep saying this, but I don't like to make comparisons here, but I'm not having as much fun with this series as, say, other ones that I've been watching recently. I I won't say this is my favorite DreamWorks animated series so far. No, because you've been a big fan of DreamWorks' work with uh, Del Toro on Netflix. Yes, like for me personally, I always felt like the Tales of Arcadia series has been the best. Whether if you say, oh, it was the best anime, it was the most artistic. No, but it definitely has the more fun element to it. It has its serious moments, but also has its silly antics moments that don't feel too over the top. For Kipo, it's interesting. Like, for me personally, I find the world a little unbelievable Hmm. and not in a good way. Because if I remember correctly, at least how Wolf described after looking at like a product that's been expired, it's suggested that it's been 200 years since whatever happened happened to the world to create this uh, apocalyptic world where the animals known as mutes kind of took over. Mm -hmm. And yet we have animals suddenly gain sentience and speech and their own societies all within a span of 200 years. Personally, as of right now, I find that a little hard to believe that that could even remotely happen within such a small span. Like to me, this feels like the Wind Waker Legend of Zelda thing was like a hundred years past. We had Zoras turn into birds in a hundred years. It can happen. It's Evolution's like, a slow process is what you're saying. It, it's supposed to Natural be slow. or otherwise. But um, obviously, I think there's some implication that there's actually a bit of science experimentation that probably happened. Uh, one of my issues with Scarlemagne or the villain, and it's not a big issue. It's just something I'm kind of tired of seeing, is I really get a Planet of the Apes vibe from him mm. where it's like, okay, yeah, animals have been locked up for a while, obviously in zoos and things like that. But now that the humans are no longer the dominant species and all the other animals, they gain sentience, they can create their own society and talking all that. Scarlamagne's old idea is like, okay, now it's the human's time to be enslaved and become our pets or whatever. And I was like, it's not a terribly unique idea, I guess, but I don't know. It, it didn't grab me as much as it did right now. But uh, Mark, you were telling me that you have some hinted suspicions of what this could mean. 
and especially in ties with Kipo's father. I kind of have a weird theory that Kipo's father is in some way kind of responsible, as weird as it sounds because it's 200 years, responsible for the apocalypse or something. or cause like, like maybe in his family's name. In his family's name, because it's Kipo is like half mute or something, as we find out. And I don't know why, but the fact that Kipo's half mute. There, clearly, Charlemagne has a history with her father, Leo. O. I was kind of getting a Powerpuff Girls, Mojo, Jojo, Professor Utonium vibe going on there. Yeah. But that was just me. No, that's very much true. And uh, to kind of conclude here, because I want to talk about Kipo a little bit. It's really interesting because like, if, if you think about it, the main cast, at least when we talk about uh, Benson, Wolf, and technically Kipo, uh, if it is implied, it truly is like a cast entirely of minorities, mm -hmm. and which is pretty cool. Uh, kind of delving into Kipo's past, like we met Leo, mm -hmm. her father, uh, doesn't really look anything like Kipo, but that's okay. Like, well, Kipo's also purple. Yeah, and Kipo's purple, and everyone else in the boroughs, when we finally see them, are not multicolored i was like okay that's interesting so yeah okay kipo has always been different her whole life and kind of changing topics slightly here uh we had an episode of the tarnagrade that yeah. evolved to become op yeah like they could kill everybody if they wanted to mm -hmm. but we get kind of a pseudo flashback for her about her father and her passed away mother coming back and what her life was like possibly at the burrows but what I found interesting about that whole thing, and I don't know if you agree with me on this, I feel like the discrimination that she got for being different was mostly all in her head, meaning she was very insecure and she didn't know where she came from, per se, because of allegedly her mother passed away after she was born. Mm -hmm. The episode kind of shows that, yeah, she has that level of insecurity. But when she finally returned to the second uh, borough, it is shown that she clearly had friends at the borough and none of them are really batting an eye against her or the mutes she brought home with her. Yeah, exactly. So it, it is weird because but there, it's implied at the beginning that there is an adversarial relationship between the mutes and the humans. And I feel like that in some ways goes somewhere and some ways doesn't because for a good amount of the mutes in this series, Kipo's able to kind of at least befriend them. Yeah. And that's why I'm thinking like either it was really good writing to kind of establish these characters think that these are problems. Mm -hmm. But in reality, when the interaction's happening, that they really aren't. Yeah, and, and if it's the case of, you know, we think there's going to be problems because we're different, but actually when we talk to each other, we find out we're not so different and we can get along. That's actually very brilliant and interesting writing. That's brilliant. Or they didn't really think that far ahead and that's just bad writing. Yeah, it's a real toss up. But and we'll probably find out by season two. Yeah, that's, that's, exa case. that's exactly what I was going to say. Because this is one of the Netflix things where it's season finale, finale by all accounts is kind of more like the mid-season finale for a regularly broadcast show. Yeah, exactly. So I, I really don't know. Um, I'm hoping it's the former, mm -hmm. that they were just being smart about it and saying like, well, these are flawed characters. They think a certain way, but once they start to exercise themselves, they'll see there is actually hope for the world. Overall, I say I was fairly entertained mm -hmm. by this show. Again, it's not my favorite of the DreamWorks animated series. That still goes down to Troll Hunters or the Tales of Arcadia series as a whole. And actually, no. Well, yeah, no, no. Troll Hunters is definitely up there. Then after that is Carmen San Diego. I just have way too much fun with that show still. Uh, I definitely think this shows a bit of an improvement over She-Ra in terms of entertainment value for me. Interesting. But not by too much because I enjoy She-Ra for what it is. But Kipo, it's a little bit more weirder and more interesting. Hmm. But that's just my opinion. I, either way, I was entertained. Uh, I am curious to see what season two brings. Uh, what are your thoughts? I see where you're coming from there, Matt. It might be a bit of a coin toss for me with uh, between it and She-Ra. Also, just because this only has one season and She-Ra is well into its run as a show already. So it's a little hard to say for me there. I will say there are shows and Netflix originals now, different demographics, sure, that I do think I preferred more. I really liked, and of course, way different demographic here. The Castlevania, but as long as we're talking Netflix original stuff and animation, Castlevania, and I mean, technically puppetry, but I do consider it a form of animation in the illusion of life. The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, I like that better. I think I like Carmen Sandiego better. Yeah, and, and quick correction on my part. I said Carmen Sandiego, that's not a DreamWorks original. 
I just realized that. That's just an original Netflix animated series. Oh, see, I thought DreamWorks did. No, no, no. That that was produced by Netflix, not DreamWorks. So uh, minor correction there. I'm sorry. Uh, Carry on. Yeah, but like by no means do I think this is entirely a bad show. I'd like to see it improve because I do think it has some flaws, but I'm interested enough to probably give season two a watch. I will say there are, and this might just because I've seen a lot of and read a lot of stuff in this similar genre and vein, but like right off the bat, I feel like the world is kind of a colorful, more fun version of Gurren Lagann just without the mechs. And I'd like to see it really differentiate itself because Gurren Lagann is like one of my favorites. And if it's going to be compared to one of my favorites, like there's no way it's going to win out at the end of the day. I want, yeah. I want it to become its own thing. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree with that. And that will do it for our review for season one of Kipo Age of the Wonder Beast. You heard our opinion, but now we want to hear yours. Let us know in the comment section below. What did you think of season one of Kipo? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Share your thoughts. Join the conversation. If you like reviews just like this, please consider subscribing to my podcast channel. Ring that bell to be notified when new videos drop. Like this video. And if you want to support me directly, please consider going to my Patreon. There you can donate as little as a dollar a month will help go towards my podcast channel, art, animation, and content made just for you. Links in the description below. This, my friends, is Matt Sella. This is Mark. Thanking you all for tuning in. Said that really weird. <laughs>